it is time to begin our Sunday evening worship. I'm so glad you're here. And if you haven't turned off your phones, put, please put them on silent or vibrate so they won't disturb the worship service. Don't forget our Wednesday morning Bible class at 10, then Wednesday evening at 7. Come back to those. And we want to remember those who are not here because of illnesses and also those who are traveling and uh, wish them a safe journey and back home and for the ill to be restored to their health and to be God's will. And those on our, that we want to specifically mention is Lionel Murray, still in the rehab at Ave Maria, and also Elizabeth Lambert, and she is not doing well at home. She's also on our shut-in list, so we want to remember Elizabeth, and Tom and Joyce Stidham, David Marshall, and Clyde Bowen, and others on your hearts and minds as well, the, the family members, so remember those as we pray for these. If you need to make any changes on the prayer list, please do so in the updates or anything so everyone will be aware of what's going on. And don't forget again, the new house to house pamphlets are on the table out front, and please take some and spread them around. It's good reading, good, good lessons. And school has started, so as we're traveling to and from work and places, uh, Remember the school speed zones and also for our students who might be out on the streets and other drivers and teachers in their jobs of teaching our children. A ladies' night out will be September the 6th, starting at 6 p.m. at Coletta's on uh, Abney. The sign up sheets on the table out front. If you can make it, please go and support each other. West Tennessee Children's Home Fall Food Drive is in full swing now, and they'll be here October the 22nd to pick up the supplies. And that's all the announcements that I have, so let's begin our worship with a prayer. Dear God, thank you so much for the day. Thank you for the opportunity and the privilege that we do have to come and worship you and have our worship be pleasing in your sight. Father, just continue to bless the church here at Quail Ridge. Help us to grow spiritually and help us to grow in numbers. But Father, mostly we just pray that you would uh, help us to be more like Jesus every day. <coughs> Father, for those who were mentioned on our prayer list, we pray your blessings on each, each of them, be with the caregivers, whether it be in home care or other facilities, be with those people who attend them, just comfort them, or say, hurry, help them return to the head. Want to be with Dale tonight as he brings another good lesson to us from your holy scriptures. Help us to test it, check it, and live by it. Father, we pray for our country, for our military personnel. Fire and police officers, all those who are our first responders, just bless them and be with their families. Be with the elders here at Quail Ridge and the deacons and everyone else who works so tired of tired of this and seeing that the work's carried out here. Help us to be a good shining light to the Father, we know we sin and fall short of your glory. Not to do the things that we should do. We pray, Father, you forgive us when we do. And we pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.
first song will be number 568. 568. <clears throat> oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem. Shining afar through shadows still, giving a light for those who long have gone, and guiding the wise men on their way under the place where Jesus lay. Oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on! Oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine upon us until the glory dawn. Oh, give us the light to light the way under the place where Jesus lay. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. Oh, beautiful star, the hope of rest, for the redeemed, the good and blessed. Yonder in glory when the crowd is won. For Jesus is now the charting path, brighter and brighter he would shine. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. Oh, beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine upon us until the glory dawn. Oh, give us the light to light the way into the land of perfect day. Beautiful star of Bethlehem, shine on. Like you can mark in the book 170. 170. This will be the song following the lesson. 170. Only a step. <coughs> now, before the lesson, let's sing number 68. Number 68. I serve our risen Savior, he's in the world today. I know that he is living, whatever man may say. I see his hand of mercy, I hear his voice of cheer. And just the time I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, for now he's a still today. He walks with me and talks with me. Along the narrow way, he lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. In all the world around me, I see his loving care, and all oh, my heart may wear me, I never will despair. I know that he is leading in all the stormy land, and the angels of hearing will come at last. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along the narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Rejoice, rejoice, O Christian, lift up your voice and sing. Eternal hallelujah, Jesus Christ, he's the King. The hope of all who seek him, the hope of all who find. No other is so loving, so good and kind. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along the narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within. 
numbers are down tonight. Might better be time to change subject matter, I guess. We're going to kind of wrap it up on a positive standpoint for the child of God. And that is, as we've been singing these songs, he does live. He rose from the grave. And we are so thankful for that. But when we look at the scriptures, when we look at some of those things that those sayings from the cross, one in particular there was John 19 and verse 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. What's finished? When you think about just that final week that we talked about this summer of his life, the final days, the final hours, the final minutes of his life. When you think about the stress that he went through, when you think about all of the problems, there are many of those things that are associated when we talk about the problems that Jesus certainly experienced in those final hours, those final days. When you think about some of the emotions that would have been there, some of the emotions that are felt at the time of death. One of those emotions is abandonment. It's common. I can remember uh, discussing this when we would have some crisis intervention discussions <coughs> within the fire department and police department and we would go over some of these things and one of the things that come about in time of grief, in time of despair, is abandonment. Someone leaves you and Obviously, it's something that is upsetting, something that you don't want to happen. Maybe it's a betrayal because someone had turned against you. Here's two areas that Jesus certainly felt both of those. He had those that had left him. He had those that betrayed him, one in particular. Another one is disappointment. Disappointment can be, again, something that is experienced, and certainly Jesus had to feel that. The helplessness. You want things to change, but they don't change. You're in a crisis. You're in a, a place in your life to where you wish you could change and make it go back to something better, but it doesn't. Christ experienced that as well. As he prayed that prayer in the garden, Lord, if it po or God, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. It was not possible. It did not pass from you. So there is that helplessness. Sometimes there's just that embarrassment. I know Jesus went through that as well. We talked about those final hours, the pride in his life. The cruel, the death, all of those things. We talked about the waiting period of Saturday and Sunday. We're going to talk about that he rose from the grave. But think about the idea of the embarrassment that he went through. Being stripped of his clothes. Being put on display. Humiliated. All of these things are things that Jesus went through. What about hopelessness? Hopelessness. Again, sometimes you wish things could be different. Jesus certainly didn't feel hopeless. He knew where he was going and what was going to transpire. So much so that he turned to the thief and told him, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He knew. So the hopelessness wasn't there for him. Not in that situation. Anger is sometimes... Uh, a situation, a problem during the crisis moment. I don't think Jesus felt anger. I think Jesus felt compassion. Jesus felt love. He looked upon the very ones that had nailed him to the cross and said, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He looked upon them with love and compassion. There's a variety of things that we can talk about, complications that can occur in that way. But Jesus died and Jesus was buried according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which also I received, that Christ died for our sins according 
to the scriptures and that he was buried. And thanks be to God, it didn't end there. It didn't end there. We know there was darkness for three hours in the middle of the day while Jesus hung on that cross. About 3 p.m. is when Jesus cried out, And Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. Bowed his head and gave up the ghost. It was over from the physical standpoint. The pain, the suffering, it was over. And for the child of God, that's the encouragement we have today. As bad as it may get, or we think it may get, there is that day coming, that Sunday's coming, when it's going to be a whole lot better in our life. It'll be over. Most of us have found out in life, the thing that we oftentimes dread the most, when it actually occurs, is not near as bad as we thought it was going. I kind of picture that for the child of God when it comes to those final hours. Jesus had those angels that were sent to comfort and strengthen. In those final hours, those final days, those final times that he was crying out and he was stressing out in the sense that the drops of sweat were coming off of him as it were drops of blood. The Father was there. The angels were there. The comfort was there. The strength was there. But as I mentioned before, oftentimes it is that unknown that frightens us the most. What's it going to be like? What am I leaving behind? That's what frightens us the most when it comes to this dreadful hour when we talk about sickness and we talk about death. We know the veil separated the holy from the most holy tore in the temple, signified the way into heaven, had not yet been manifest, Hebrews 9, 8. But when justification for sins was made by the death of Jesus, the hope to enter into that which is within the veil was established, Hebrews 6, 19 and 20. The reading of that veil signified, you had the old, here's the new. When Jesus died, the Bible says the earth did quake, the rocks were rent, graves were open, many bodies of the saints were raised. And coming out of the graves after the resurrection, they entered into Jerusalem and appeared unto many people, Matthew 27, 50 through 53. These signs, along with many others, demonstrated and showed the power of God and showed that Jesus Christ is what? And will always be the son of the living God. When the Roman soldiers heard the sayings of Jesus and observed his death with those accompanying signs, they glorified God, saying, truly, this man was the son of God. When the multitudes that gathered to see the show beheld the things that were done, says they return smiting their breast. Pretty good sign signify that maybe they changed some thinking. I think that's why a little over a month later there was some 3,000 that had changed their way of thinking. There were some 3,000 that wanted to get their lives right. Some 3,000 on that day that said, hmm, we, we may have made a mistake. We made a mistake. We crucified the Son of God. The Jews, in order to comply with their law, asked Pilate, of course, to break the legs of Jesus to kind of speed up the death, John 19, 31. The soldiers did break the legs of two thieves, but finding Jesus already gone, they thrust a spear into the side of his body straightway, of course. Out came blood and water, John 19, 34. That which is prophesied, Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. So many statements of blessings because of the blood of the cross, among which are the sealing of the New Testament, remission of sins, the opening of the new, the living way, all the benefits that are there, all the things that have been prophesied, every eye dotted, every T crossed. Jesus fulfilled every one 
of those statements, those prophetic statements that had been made. Every one of those promises that had been made, everything had been completed in Christ. So when we look at the idea, it is finished. Think about that statement for a moment. At the point of death, what is finished? For Jesus, there probably was a lot more that was finished than what we might say, but from a physical standpoint, death, pain, suffering, all of that, it was done, it was finished. There would never be any more of it, not for Christ. There'll never be any more of that for ones that have passed on. For our loved ones that have passed on in Christ, there'll never be another funeral service they'll have to attend. There'll never be another hospital visit or doctor's visit that they'll have to make. It's finished. As I said, for Christ, it may have gone obviously a little bit further from the statement it's finished. The Old Testament was finished. The old way was done. The new will, the New Testament was about to go into effect. It is finished. The old saying, when one door closes, another opens. Well, that was the case with Christ too. Yes, there were some things that were finished, but there were some things that were about to begin too. But from the standpoint of the torture, the torment, the pain, the suffering, all of those things, it was finished. When he breathed that last breath, he would never have to go through any of that again. And people say today, when they talk about the tribulation or the rapture or whatever it may be, that somehow Jesus is coming back to this old world to go through it again, where people can torture him and torment him. No, no, it's finished. We'll meet him in the air, but he ain't coming back here. Would you? After being treated the way that he was. So when we look at the significance there, let's turn over to Matthew chapter 28. If you have your Bibles with you, and just briefly here. Let's talk about the first ten verses there of chapter 28 of the book of Matthew. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary, excuse me, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And the fear of him, the keepers did shake uh, and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not, ye, for I know that you seek Jesus, which is crucified. He's not here. He's risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly, tell the disciples that he's risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee, and there shall, you shall see him. Uh, lo, I told you. And uh, they departed quickly from fear and great joy and did run to bring the disciples' word. And as they went <coughs> to tell the disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, All hail. And they came and uh, held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go tell the, my brethren that they uh, go into Galilee. And there... They shall see me. What an amazing event that occurred. And if it had not occurred, then this would not be the hope that we so desperately needed and would be talking about for centuries. That is the hope of Jesus Christ. If he had just simply lived the life that he lived, died the death that he died, and still remained in the grave that he was buried in, he's not the Christ, the Son of God. But he did. He came out of that grave just like he said he would. The surprising thing to me when you look at this account is these women and even that inner circle, the disciples, the apostles, they didn't get it. The angel reminds him, he told you this is what was going to happen. He told you how all this is going to play out, and yet they were shocked. He's not there. He rose from the grave. 
As I've mentioned before, that stone was rolled away so they could look in, not so Jesus could get out. He didn't need the stone rolled away to get out. But that stone needed to be rolled away so they could look in and see that he wasn't there. And yet, there seemed to be shock that he was not there. According to the four gospels, Jesus rose from the dead following that crucifixion. Matthew records how the women found the tomb empty and were instructed by an angel to tell the disciples. and Also how Jesus appeared to them while on their way. In all, the New Testament records 10 distinct resurrection appearances of Christ prior to his ascension back to the right hand of the Father. The significance of the resurrection of Jesus to our faith as Christians is something that should never be underestimated. It is such a significant action that took place that day and the days prior that it should not be understated. And it should be that of great encouragement to the unbeliever that needs to believe and needs to understand that even secular historians recorded many of the events that we're looking at here in the scriptures. Many of them, like Josephus, come along and say, well, can't you know completely explain it, but here's some things that happen, and it's things that go right in line with the Word of God. These things occur. Sure, the soldiers... We're trying to excuse it, saying, well, they stole the body. Got to, got to. The, the leadership said, we're going to tell everybody they stole the body away. That's what secular historians are pretty much saying. They didn't steal the body. The body walked away. The body walked away. That's a significance for the believer and the unbeliever. To those that aren't Christian and to those who are Christian. For the unbeliever, it, number one, verifies Jesus Christ is both Lord and he will be Savior if you'll, elect, if you'll allow him to be. It verifies that deity. It proves the deity of Jesus. Otherwise, the resurrection couldn't have, and it wouldn't have happened. But it did, Romans 1 and verse 4. It also demonstrates that he truly has all authority in heaven and on earth, which we see in Matthew 28. He has all that authority that the Father has bestowed upon him because he rose from the grave just like he said he would do. Not only do we talk about verifying the deity, but also the truthfulness of Jesus. Jesus foretold his resurrection three different occasions, Matthew 16, 21, Chapter 17, 22, and 23, and Matthew chapter 20, 17 through 19. Again, Matthew 16, 21, Matthew 17, 22, and 23, and Matthew 20, 17 through 19. These are accounts that we look at when we began to understand. Matthew 16 and verse 21 is where he says, From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem, suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes, and be killed, and be raised again the third day. He told them. But they weren't listening. Oh, they may have heard what he said. But oh, no, that's not going to happen. Somebody ever tell you something and you just kind of kind of blow it off, say, ah, oh, no, you don't know what you're talking about. Jesus told them on three occasions there at least exactly how all this was going to play out and what was going to happen. Ah, no. You know, even Peter there towards the end said, Oh, no. Everybody else may forsake you, but not me. They'll have to kill me too. So when we talk about Jesus' teaching, when we talk about those teachings being true, he was from the Father above and spoke the words of the Father, John 8, 28, 29. 
His blood was shed for the remission of sins, Matthew 26 and verse 28. He came to offer abundant life, John 10, 10, to prepare a place for us, as we've talked about during this series of lessons, John 14, 2. And verse 3 makes it very clear, John 14, he's coming again, folks. And whether he comes in our lifetime or we meet him because of death, either way, our fate is sealed and we're going to hear well done or depart from me depending on whether or not we've been obedient. There's going to be a resurrection of the dead and there's going to be an ensuing judgment. John 5, 28 and 29 speaks of that day. It speaks of that day. It's coming. 5, 28 and 29, marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice. And shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, they that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation. Some have separated those two times, but that's not a separation there that Jesus is speaking of, and John is quoting there in John 5. Both. Resurrection of life, resurrection of damnation, both occur at the same time. Both occurring at the same time. You can also see that in John 12, 48, Acts 17, 30, and 31. It's a fact Jesus was raised from the dead. And the significance is so clear for the unbeliever, but it is so clear and should encourage you and I as believers as well. If Jesus had not been raised, then we're preaching in vain. 1 Corinthians 15, 14. All the things that we say about Christ, about the apostles, about the cross, all of that is in vain. It's useless. It's useless. And there's really no purpose in preaching because he is a liar and a lunatic if all of those things are not true. Our faith is in vain. The apostles were false witnesses. And worst of all, you and I are still in our sins. We're still in our sins. They haven't been washed away. They haven't been forgiven. If he is not. If he's not been raised from the dead. As a matter of fact, many of the, many of the world today pity Christians because of this. Say, oh, you poor, ignorant individuals. You poor, ignorant individuals. You just don't know what you're talking about. The Bible's not true. The things that you read about, the things concerning Christ, he may have been a good man, but he didn't raise, he wasn't raised from the dead. There won't be a day of the resurrection. Sadly, many are going to find out that it's all true way too late. Because he has been raised. It verifies the justification. It demonstrates the power of that's in the gospel of Christ and the power that's in the blood of Christ. And it gives you and I hope. If God the Father did it to the Son, He's going to do it again to you and I. It first starts with the burial in water, doesn't it? That emulates that whole process of that death, that burial, and that resurrection to life. That's where it began. But it demands that we're faithful and that we're loyal. Romans 14 and verse 9. He was raised and then exalted to become our Lord. Acts 2, 32 through 36. So the impact of the resurrection of Jesus should not go unfelt in our lives. It should be taken seriously. We can get through whatever this world hands to us, but we can only get through it successfully in Christ Jesus. You're not in Christ Jesus. Then today is the day. Now is the time. If you're in Christ Jesus, but you haven't been, that hasn't been a priority for you. Serving our Lord, being faithful to that Lord. Then today is the day. Now is the time. If we can assist you now, won't you come while we stand and sing?